Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to um, this session of our global public sociology conversations. I'm really glad that you chose to spend your Thursday afternoon with us this afternoon, and I'm sure that you will find that it was worthwhile making that decision. Um, uh, before we start, I'd like to, or as we start, I would like us to um, acknowledge that we are on the presence of um, um, many indigenous nations. And so the land acknowledgement for those of you who are not in Canada and may not be familiar with this, is an acknowledgement um, that we make to um, about the, the, the relationship, ongoing relationship that we have as settlers with the indigenous communities and the indigenous people, and particularly to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of the work that we do, and, and in particular, as you'll hear, that our university is indeed situated on indigenous land. So York University recognizes that many nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Ashinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Hurun Wendat, it is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. My name is Sylvia Bauer, and I'm an associate professor of sociology here at York University. And I also happen to be the director of the Resource Center for Public Sociology, which is hosting this conversation. Whilst you may not be on camera, I just also want to introduce you to um, Sue Foster, Susan Foster, from whom many of you would have heard. Um, she's been a fantastic support in terms of organizing all of these conversations. And today we are going to be discussing solidarity in general, and especially um, in this moment or in a very long moment of crisis, depending on where you want to situate this historical moment. Um, and as such, I would like to introduce the panelists we have for today's conversation. Um, and then the way in which we'll proceed is that after the introduction, each of our panelists would give brief opening remarks um, and then the panelists can respond to each other if they like. And then I'll start with some um, questions. Um, if you are at, after the opening remarks, if you have questions to ask, you can put up your hand or you can type it in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat and I'll be trying to facilitate the conversation. Remember that we are having a conversation and as such, um, the plan is that you join in the conversation and that you, um, um, you, con you, you, you contribute in, in any way that you can. So I'd like to start by introducing uh, our speakers and our panelists, and I'll start with the person who is our guest really today, Aicha Chubukchu, who is an associate professor in human rights and the co-director of the London School of Economics, human rights at uh, of human rights. I got that wrong, sorry. She's an associate professor in human rights and co-director of LSC Human Rights at the London School of Economics and Political Science. In 2020, she was appointed as a senior fellow of the FANG Global Fellows Program at Princeton University. Dr. Chubukchu leads the international... <laughs> the internationalism, cosmopolitanism, and the politics... Time. In a bit when I'm done. Dr. Chubukchu leads the international, internationalism, cosmopolitanism, and politics of solidarity research group at LSC. She's also an honorary member of the Center on Social Movement Studies at the European University Institute, the co-editor of LSC's International Studies series at Cambridge University Press, and co-editor of, Human, of Humanity Journal, as well as the co-editor of Jadalias, um, Turkey Press. She's also the author of the acclaimed book, For the Love of Humanity, um, The World Tribunal on Iraq. So um, welcome to York University, Dr. Chubukchu. I would also now like to introduce um, one of our own from the Department of Sociology. She's a PhD candidate, I am told very soon, to defend, um, or just waiting to defend, as it were, 
um, Rana Sakurie, who is a sociology instructor at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, and she is joining us from Lebanon. A PhD dissertation examines the interplay of endogenous and exogenous factors shaping the trajectory of the Palestinian boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, in Toronto. Her latest co-authored article is Publics Forum in the Algerian and Lebanese Hiraks, or Autonomy in the Making. Welcome, welcome back to York, Rana. <laughs> Um, our last, but um, definitely not the least, just recent past chair of the Department of Sociology in-house professor, um, Leslie Wood is Associate Professor of Sociology at York University here in Toronto. She is the author of Direct Action, Deliberation and Diffusion of Cambridge University Press and Crisis and Control, the Militarization of Protest Policing. Um, welcome, um, Leslie, to your own department or home department. I'm really excited that you agreed, um, all three of you, to have this conversation at a really difficult, um, challenging time of the term. I'm sure many of us are really very exhausted. Dr. Chibukchu is joining us um, from, um, from London, the UK, um, and four hours ahead of us. So she probably has insights into the future that we would be glad to see. But I think Rana, seven hours, right? Rana, seven hours ahead of us. So even more insight um, into where we are starting from um, in Canada. So welcome everyone. And I'll now turn, um, uh, turn us all over to Dr. Chibukchu to start with the opening remarks. And so um, Aisha, the floor, virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Bawa. Um, thank you to RCPS Global Public Sociology Conversation Series, the Department of Sociology at York, and to all the participants for joining us. Um, this is a very difficult moment globally as um, also, sorry, my thanks to Sue as well, who's been fantastic. Um, so this is a very difficult moment globally, I think. In my introductory remarks, I thought I would situate myself and my work, which may uh, speak to uh, the preoccupations I have at the moment, uh, because they're longstanding occupations, preoccupations with discourses of humanity and uh, their use and abuse, however you want to look at it. Mostly I've been concerned and working with anti-war movements, particularly the global anti-war movement that emerged in response to the occupation of Iraq. I've been interested in discourses and uh, ideologies of anti-imperialism, what demands of anti-imperialism, how they've been interpreted in particular conjunctures, not only over Iraq, but also uh, the war in Libya. And now I've been thinking more and more about Ukraine. Um, so these are my primary concerns. I've been very taken by the attention given to Ukraine and the kind of arguments uh, that are uh, being mobilized in relation to Ukraine. I'm not sure if one can speak of a social movement in response to uh, the war in Ukraine, but uh, I think on the top of my uh, concerns right now is solidarity politics that asks for war and violence. Um, often when we speak about social movements, there is an implicit assumption um, in literature, not everywhere, but they are left leaning, uh, that they are a force for good, Etc. So I've been involved in those social movements, both as an observer, as an activist. Um, but there is another side to politics of solidarity that calls for um, humanitarian intervention and sometimes even war. So uh, those are 
at the forefront of my concerns tonight. Um, globally, I think it's difficult to speak about social movements at this juncture, given their diversity. So movements calling for war on the one hand, Black Lives Matter movement, feminist movement, labor movements, indigenous struggles, movements for decolonization, uh, movements for climate justice, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist mobilizations, the BDS movement that Rana, I imagine, will be speaking about, mobilizations for refugees. Uh, so I think I would like to call for some contextual specificity when we are discussing the politics of solidarity at this moment, because we bring uh, different concerns and expertise, um, also conjectural, to the table. So yes, that's the background to my participation this evening. So thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. And indeed, um, you know, it is one of the things that I'm sure we'll get to have a conversation on all of these things that are happening. It's almost as if one cannot keep track from one thing to the next and, and, and so on. Rana, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you and hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for everyone who made this happen. It's great to be here with great minds. I want to really start by thinking about the crisis. Which crisis are we talking about? Is it the pandemic? Is it the imperial wars? Rise of fascism? Economic recession? What about compounded crises that arrive at the, like, they were, the existence of multiple crises at the same time? And I was really thinking, is the crisis something new? Don't we have an ongoing crisis, ongoing imperial wars? Is that something that's totally new? So this is this is where most of uh, uh, most of my thinking was towards this newness of this crisis. So I, I was thinking maybe the wars in some areas are normalized that we do not think of them anymore. Or maybe the bodies of certain people are not deemed to be important. So that's why we do not think that there is a crisis. So here I'm thinking about Palestine, Kashmir, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Kurds, increased inequalities around the world, more racial inequalities. Aren't they all crisis? So that's the first thing that really uh, uh, caught my mind. And we tend to think about crisis only when there is what's called like these uh, moments of excess, whenever there is this temporal compression and too many things happening at the same time, but the crisis is ongoing. And we think about the crisis only when the effects of this crisis become visible in the Western media. So that said, uh, despite all what I mentioned about this ongoing crisis, uh, Needless to say that the pandemic specifically created a major historic or transformative event in our life. All of a sudden and overnight, we are confined to our homes. We are fighting an invisible virus. We have national emergencies, curfews, limited mobility. And in most places, there was a milita militarization of the public sphere, uh, of the public space. And although these have created limited opportunities for social movement to be visible on the street, they, the collective action, I think, took different forms, mainly through caring, through charity practices, to help mainly the, vulner the most vulnerable people. When I was thinking about the imperial wars and the rise of, of fascism, frankly, I do not think any anything is new. The only difference is that this uh i mean the global structures of oppression exist with different hats whether it's the nato that is doing the wars or whether it's russia at the end there are people that are being killed and there are countries that are being invaded uh and what's interesting and i'm so looking forward to to have this discussion about international solidarity is what are we expecting from international solidarity? Like Aisha mentioned, it's important to definitely contextualize, but how do we see international solidarity? 
we what we are looking at least what i am looking and i'm sure many people around in this room share the same uh, concerns as well is that we need international solidarity that uh, deploys discourses and practices that does not discriminate between the different struggles, actually that links the struggles together, that treats all human bodies as equal and and all human bodies to be worth of living and to like their struggle is, is worth fighting for. And I'm looking for international solidarity that centers the voice of the oppressed and the marginalized and that listens to their demands. Do not hijack their demands or tell them what exactly are, are, are your demands supposed to be. We do not want liberal feminists to praise Madeleine Albright who passed away yesterday as being the first woman as a head of the state because she's just a woman. While she is responsible for the killing of millions of Iraqis, and as she said it in an interview when she was asked by a journalist whether the price was worth it, the price of killing half a million Iraqis children, she said the price was worth it. It's so demeaning, so, so dehumanizing, so frustrating. So there is a hypocrisy in the solidarity. We are all against wars, but when the international community discriminate uh, against the struggle or between the struggles, when sports avenues, corporations, states, universities, museums, and you name it, all of a sudden one day becomes against the Russian in one day while the Palestinians or the Iraqis or the Kashmiris have been struggling. Uh, or maybe it's better to say, uh, instead of saying struggling to, to have solidarity, maybe it's better to say that the process to, stay, to stand in solidarity with them is extremely, small, uh, is extremely slow. So it's very interesting to think around these lines. And, and what's even more, more interesting for me is to think how the war at the moment in Ukraine um, will change the future uh, international solidarity. Like I'm thinking specifically about the BDS movement who uh, uh, issued actually a statement about the hypocrisy of many uh, of mainly the Western, uh, uh, you know, uh, movements and sports avenues and institutions and so on. Uh, every time the BDS calls for a boycott or for divestment from Israeli, uh, you know, uh, companies, they always say that, oh, this is not, this is too political. We do not interfere in this. We should not do that. And right now, all of a sudden, the political became allowed in avenues where the politics was not allowed. So does that facilitate the work of BDS in the future? And I'm just saying BDS because it's my work. I work mainly on BDS, but it's for all the other, you know, uh, movements. So. Uh, I will leave it here and um, and just like this is this these are some of the ideas that I had in mind whenever when you sent me that invite. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rana, for that and for you know asking that ever present question: which crisis, right? From one um, to the next, and how do we engage in this kind of transnational solidarity? Um, I'll hand over now to Leslie Wood. Hmm. Interesting to come third. Okay. Um, thank you again for organizing this. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. So if the question is, you know, how do we build solidarity amongst social movements in a time of crisis that are trying to build a better world? It's a big question. Of course, it's a question that, that comes out when there's a perception of crisis. Um, how do we support the struggles for justice? On the one hand, it seems almost... And this is the cynic in me, which doesn't always raise its head, but it seems a little laughable. We're in a period of um, building walls, shutting down migrants, rising ethno-nationalism, controlling movement. Um, safety is seen through containment um, and, we, and solidarity is being criminalized, right? So this week I got a message about um, an Italian mayor, Mimo Lucano, who was sentenced to 13 years in prison for uh, the crime of welcoming migrants to his community. Uh, this is a situation where we have uh, it, not just social movements, but humanitarianism being criminalized. Um, so, you know, I can put information about that in the chat. But on the other hand, you've got, um, it's the obvious task. We must figure out how to build solidarity. There is no other alternative. 
Um, COVID, you know, on the most basic level, thumbed its nose at borders. Um, we, you know, it reinforced our understanding, our long held understanding that the most vulnerable, uh, we have to make, take, make sure that the most vulnerable are protected because everyone is connected. Um, and, you know, this is something that had been being argued for many years in many different struggles, climate justice and beyond. I'm thinking about what both I, John, Rana was talking, we're talking about in crisis. And I'm thinking, how do we understand the relationships between these different crises and how they affect solidarity? And I think that's where Rana was getting at the end. I almost want to imagine some sort of a, a kind of a, a, a diagram or a, a graph where you're saying, you're seeing, okay, this struggle, this struggle, this struggle, because it's always the combination of these different crises and struggles um, that are shaping what's going on. And our uh, tools for analysis are really limited and our tools for organizing are really limited. We can seem to have a real ability to pay attention to one thing at a time. And, we, and that is stopping us from being able to make change. If the question is just the straightforward one of how, um, as an organizer, maybe as a thinker around who thinks about some of this stuff, I, I think, okay, first you've got to connect people, right? You've got to connect things. You've got to create the ties. You've got to create some sort of identification. It doesn't mean that people have to see themselves as the same, right? But they have to see themselves as linked or have something in common, whether it's, you know, and there's, that's where all this cultural work and these narratives and these discourses, you've got to be able to build some sort of a trust. It doesn't have to be, you know, I trust you with my life, everything, but there needs to be some sort of um, ability to have sustained engagement. There has to be an understanding of the different positionalities and power relations between the different um, people engaged in solidarity practices. And there needs to be some sort of action, right? Following the lead when needed, right? Communicating when needed, that sort of engagement. And then I would say number six on my list was the ability to um, increase the scale, right? Communicate the need for solidarity in a way that respects the particularities of the solidarity. Just, just a suggestion as like <laughs> a six point plan. Uh, and I'm curious to hear what the rest of you think. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you came with, um, with a plan at least, Leslie. We, we probably should put it to the test. And I mean, it, it reinforces your, you know, some of your arguments, especially a very, your suggestion that direct action does get results. Um, so perhaps this is the invitation to direct action. So I'd like to open it up to, um, all of you to discuss if you want to respond to each other or say something a little bit more before I ask one or two questions. And um, um, members of the audience are also invited to submit questions or put up your hand. Um, yes. Go ahead, um, thank you, Rana and Leslie, for those opening comments. Um, I've been following the efforts to create an anti-war movement in response to the situation of Ukraine, in Ukraine, and the accusations of what about um, that have been leveled against activists trying to point out that the crisis in Ukraine um, is actually basically saying what Rana just said, listing uh, other crises around the world and questioning simply the act of questioning why is uh, this selective outrage? Simply asking why lives are grieved differently? Why are so-called white and blue-eyed refugees treated differently by the European Union, for example, or Poland. So asking these questions themselves by uh, certain potential activists have been posed as problematic. So I want to suggest that what Rana just said is crucial 
raising these difficult questions about the differential distribution of solidarity, empathy uh, is crucial if we are going to build far from being detrimental, they're crucial to building the kind of trust that Leslie just talked about, to building the kind of global mobilizations that are, in my book, uh, perhaps they would be anti-capitalist, anti-war, anti-imperialist. So what I want to suggest is that it's precisely these types of questions that we need to put on the table uh, rather than uh, sidestepping them through discourses of, let's say, universal humanity uh, or a blank humanitarian sentiment that is supposed to be extended to everybody, regardless of their national, racial, political backgrounds. So uh, again, what Leslie just pointed out, attending to um, differential power relations, colonial histories, the very constitution of human, humanitarianism is intimately linked with uh, empire and colonialism. So we have to raise, I think, these very difficult and uncomfortable questions. Um, yes, so I will leave it at that and perhaps others have responses to that. Yeah, thank you, Aicha. Um, Leslie, Rana, response. Yeah. Leslie, go ahead. I mean, one of the things that's, uh, it's not really about direct action, but I, I, you know, that's interesting is there's almost a sense that if you talk about other struggles, you're no longer in solidarity. And exactly. I, I think this is, and then the replacement is, sort of this neutral discourse that says it's all it's all the same. So you, your choice is, you know, either you're in solidarity and blocking out um, history <laughs> and power uh, and only focusing on this thing, or you can move to this, but the option of how, trying to create a multi-layered, multi, a complex solidarity that recognizes this is somehow seen as, um, as damaging, I don't know, just, to, I think this is what you were saying, Aja, but I'm just, but it is very interesting to me. It's like, why is this the problem? <laughs> I mean, there's easy answers to that, but like, how do we get past that? Yeah, go ahead, Rana. Ah, great questions, actually. Um, I'm gonna give an example uh, from uh, the BDS movement in Toronto. Um, when Black Lives Matter, um, you know, emerged and uh, there was this discussion that historically the Palestinians and the Black people were always in solidarity and what can be done at the moment. And uh, I remember one of the discussion that was I think, Rana, I think you're frozen. Okay. And I think Rana is um, falling oh. off. It might be a connection issue. The problem with global solidarity is the internet. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> especially in this time of virtual everything. How do we exactly. actually exactly. do that? Yeah. Um, so I, I know Rana will be joining in soon. I don't know whether I, okay, she's back. Um, um, I thought everything froze, so, so I don't know what an example of these difficult questions from real life experience when the BDS emerged in, uh, sorry, when the uh, Black Lives Matter emerged in Toronto. And there was this discussion between the Palestinians and the Blacks that, you know, we have long history of solidarity that's rooted since the 50s and 60s and what can be done at the moment. 
So uh, one of the things that was uh, discussed and was suggested by many Black Lives Matter activists is that uh, we know you are in solidarity with us, but show us that you can uh, fight the anti-Blackness racism that exists in the Arab society whether it's in the homeland or whether it is among the, uh, the Arab community. So the organizers that are, are also organizers with the BDS movement started uh, to, uh, doing some community organizing within the Arab community to fight anti-Blackness. So you can see rather than just only discourses of solidarity at the moment, this has been uh, translated into real action. Is it solved? Of course not. That's a long process. It takes years and years. Something that has been, uh, you know, this racism that exists and has been building up for centuries, it does not erase overnight. But it's very important to raise these difficult questions, as Aisha said. And we really need to understand as as uh, uh, activists, as researchers, as people, as human beings that, you know, something, this will take time. So, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Rana. And I'd just like to tag on to that question. Um, you Can know, you hear me? Yes. But I think you are frozen on my screen now anyway. Um, so I'll just tag on to this question. Uh, maybe you can you can rejoin if that helps, because I think then otherwise you would be frozen for a while on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to tag on to um, you know the question, some of the questions that you raised, um, all of you, and ask you know what does true transnational global solidarity really look like? And I think Rana, you've started to answer that question in a bit, but especially in the face of so much tragedy. And, and, and injustice, what does it, you know, how do we demonstrate that solidarity beyond feelings of empathy, right? You know, it is one thing to hear that, you know, we empathize, we are in solidarity, but what does it mean? What is the action? How is that supposed to be demonstrated and how can others know that we are in solidarity with their causes across that? One of the other things, and perhaps because Rana has been freezing a bit, time. Um, yes, there are more pressing issues here, apparently, than global solidarity in a bit. Um, and one of the other things I'd like you to also address um, in relation, uh, in addition to that question is, you know, the fact that we now live in this increasingly complex um, world of social media, advanced technology, even artificial intelligence, sophisticated state um, surveillance that are, and then we also have what, you know, others have described as a very short attention span. Perhaps not a short attention span as much as well. We are dealing with this and in the middle of trying to deal with this, then this other event happens and then we just keep jumping from one thing to the other. To the other. How are activists or how are social movements navigating these kinds of um, dynamics? And what are your thoughts and reflections? This is a very big question on what seems to be like generational differences in terms of how we organize or mobilize or demonstrate solidarity for that matter. <laughs> you should just come to Rana's dissertation defense. She'll explain it all. <laughs> but go ahead, I just... <laughs> Exactly. Those are uh, very challenging, difficult, and huge questions. I do want to emphasize that, at least in my judgment, we can't be moving from one crisis to the other. Uh, it is extremely important to do, in my opinion, the quotidian everyday work, long-standing, slow work of building solidarity in action, the unrewarding, the unsensational, the difficult work in between crises. I want to say that, but then we're in a permanent state of exception anyways, depending on whose perce perception of history uh, we adopt. So it's those uh, processes, I think, that have been interrupted by COVID. Um, I want to emphasize the importance of doing face-to-face -face work. 
But we've had two years of disruption of that kind of work while new technology, I didn't know what Zoom was. Maybe I was ignorant before COVID. Um, but now we're connected in, in this way. Um, of course, there's the digital divide uh, still, but I see opportunities here as well as the generational differences that map onto older forms of organizing before the times of social media. Even I remember very well organizing with Leslie, for example, in the direct action network in New York City, uh, mobilizing against the World Trade Organization, et cetera. So maybe post COVID, if we are entering that world, I'm not even sure. We need to think of new ways of um, interfacing, face-to-face -face, uh, organizing of the kind that Rana is speaking about, the difficult work, incorporating this new simultaneity that is emerging around the world, incorporating social media strategies. But social media can never be a replacement of the quotidian worlds of organizing and the difficult discussions that don't fit into those short time spans, attention spans that uh, Sylvia was talking about. And the last thing I want to say is that we have to study older traditions of internationalism. We have to learn uh, different internationalisms, whether it be communist internationalism, feminist internationalism, anarchist internationalism, um, you know, anti-colonial third worldism. There is something to learn from all these traditions. So we're not only alone around the world, but also we're not alone across history. Uh, so it's an invitation for us to study as well. Thank you. Yeah, Leslie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I liked the idea of not being alone across history. Um, I was thinking about that as well. I mean, I think there was an idea that there was a new form of solidarity that emerged at the beginning of this century or actually the end of the last one um, of this idea that Zapatista solidarity said, you, you're in solidarity by working on the struggles where you're at because they're all connected through global capitalism and neoliberalism. Um, and I, 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 you know, there was lots of slogans at the time, but the, this idea that there are, there's one no many yeses, um, which I think allows for me anyway, to not feel so frantic when thinking about having to choose, you know, which struggles you say, okay, I'm doing the work, I'm building the trust and it is connected. And my piece of it is, um, is part of a larger whole and you can't, no one person can do it all, right? And, it's, and if you're gonna build the trust effectively, you have, to, um, you have to be serious about doing the work. A few years ago, I did a, a project um, looking at lethal violence um, against protesters and um, you know, had a it was a very uh, very cheery project where I looked at all the cases around the world where protesters had been killed in 2017, and there were like 15 countries, and then looked at the the cases under which there were solidarity mobilizations in support of those who had been killed, and there were only five of those, um, and uh, the ones that that did have solidarity were in Togo, India, Iran, Venezuela, and Israel, Palestine. And then tried to understand why those were the ones that had these solidarity mobilizations. Um, and of course it's tied to some of the things we've been talking about, right? Networks, trust building, and also brokerage where people were explaining why it was important to, to rise up and using different traditions that I was just talking about of internationalism in some cases, uh, you know, Muslim internationalism, in other cases, an anti-imperialist or uh, a third worldist, and sometimes a diasporic um, kind of nationalist internationalism, right? Uh, which, yeah, I know I see Gulai is here and talking about the Kurdish case, um, but it's, uh, these traditions are still there, they're still active and they're alive. And so I think it allows us 
to, um, to recognize that we can do more than one thing at the same time, even when we're really doing one thing, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It does. Um, you know, maybe we can also clone ourselves on social media, <laughs> which is another way to go. <laughs> Rana, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so in my dissertation, yes, I do look at this intergenerational continuity between um, uh, Palestinian and other Arab uh, activists in Toronto. And there is this... Um, what I call perceived barriers or perceived discontinu uh, discontinuity between generations. I always heard uh, elderly people talk about the new, the new ones, like what are they doing or vice versa. Uh, and uh, I always, uh, heard that you know there is limited intergeneration so this, i see there is a continuity but in different forms of expression so right now it is mainly um a social media but social media is not alone social media is only a way to connect the people but then later on there's always a face-to-face And this is where my paranoia sets in. And I think there's someone there who doesn't want us to hear all of these great ideas from Rana sometimes. Um, but I think Rana will, um, will join again. I just wanted to also um, let people know that you can um, ask questions now. If you're interested in asking um, questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and I will um, scan the room every now and again. So while we are waiting for Rana and- okay. Great, continue. Sylvia, did you hear me? Sorry, we, I, just, I but, found out that I was talking to myself. Yes, <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. We got to where you talked about the fact that they were um, the perception of intergenerational um, discontinuity, where as you are finding that there is actually continuity just expressed in different forms. So that was sort of where we lost you. Yes, discontinuity. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly where, what I was saying. So I was specifically talking about social media for the uh, younger uh, activists that is being used, uh, but uh, it's not used on its own. So usually it is a way to connect to others, to know about others, but there's always an uh, 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 in-person interaction taking place. Uh, and like, I, frankly, I used to be very critical about social media until very recently, I found out that during the pandemic and all these Zoom meetings that we had and the conferences, I, it, was, it was a golden opportunity to learn about the, the struggles everywhere around the world because all of a sudden everything became online and it became accessible to every one of us to know what's happening around the world. Now, uh, when it, so so it's very important to think about these uh, these expressions of uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, organizing or activism work. You know the elderly activists are always critical of like new forms of activism, whether it's like cultural expression. Uh, it is uh, whether it is uh, an art exhibition, like they do not think it is political. So I think one reason for that, and this is my suggestion, is that uh, there is a different understanding of politics, um, specifically when I'm talking about the Arab community in Toronto, I can see that the elderly tend to think about politics in a very traditional way, like, like it means participation in political parties, going to elections, etc. While the younger generation used to think about it in a very broader way, where even cultural expressions are forms of solidarity. So what I'm suggesting here is that this intergenerational barriers that we build are in reality only perceived. And this creates some barriers between, um, between the continuity in solidarity. Like my interest is specifically how can we build sustained solidarity? 
So it's that's why it's very important to have these discussions because when we have these discussions, we will find out that you know in reality we are continuing the older uh, the older traditions, but in different forms. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, I mean, I think this is. Um, Oh, I just want to use this opportunity to think through with with you and with anyone, I guess, is uh, so even though there's all these alternative kind of uh, discourses of, uh, of solidarity or not alternative, they're traditions of solidarity. There's still the dominance of the idea of human rights. And I get into debates with people all the time about the like, is it something that we can still use? And, and if so, how? Um, and so, yeah, what do, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, good, good, good question. Yes, I don't know if you are asking Rana to kick off um, the, the, the round of answers to that. And, and especially it's one of also the questions that I think that um, Aisha has asked in her work in terms of the suggestions for what some of the more pressing um, questions of our time should be, um, you know, and especially also in connection with international law more broadly. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, uh, like, I can't figure out this is a question that may rise in my um, dissertation defense, so <laughs> I, it's better to be prepared. Uh, uh, so uh, this is an excellent question, and actually uh, it's always there whether uh, shall we use the language of human rights, uh, international law, knowing the limitation of international law, because let's face it, international law has been used and is still used for to serve the imperialist. Nevertheless, it is definitely a tool that can be used for advancing social movements. Like, for example, international law prohibits apartheid, prohibits annexation, population transfer. Uh, in the context of Palestine, for example, they stress on the right uh, of return of Palestinians. So yes, sometimes there is a hypocrisy in the implementation of the international law, and sometimes some of the internet, and I think Aisha can uh, can highlight more in because she talks about uh, you know how international law was deployed in uh, in Libya and in Iraq. Uh, can we use? Can we still use the the language of human rights? Of course, we can use it, but it's not enough. It's maybe it's good as a start for the conversation for building the relationship. But it's not enough because it's very important also to critique some of these uh, tools that exist for us, such as international law and, and humanity and, and human rights. Yeah. Um, there's a hand. Yes, there's a, um, yeah, Gule, you can unmute and ask your question or contribute as it were. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this great conversation. Uh, there is a lot to think about and reflect upon, definitely. Uh, since Leslie uh, pointed out to my research and also like the discussions are very much resonating what I have been thinking so far about my uh, research on Kurdish political movement. Uh, I wanna uh, ask about the uh, role of criminalization uh, since we are talking about the human rights. Uh, some of the social movements around the world, including Kurdish political movement and the, the, the anti-colonial struggle that the PKK has been giving uh, since last 40 years, uh, uh, has been criminalized and actually the PKK has been put on the terrorist list. So because of this criminal, criminalization in many, uh, for many social movements, like socialist movements, uh, especially in Europe, uh, they have been using the uh, human rights discourse strategically, but this has been also transforming the movements themselves and also the form of solidarity as well. So I'm wondering um, what uh, the, the panelists uh, think about the role of criminalization uh, in establishing uh, solidarities, both contingent and sustained solidarities. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, go ahead. May I, I? Shall I respond to Leslie or Gulai or both? Both. Okay. Uh, 
Well, my thinking has changed over the past, I don't know, 15 years on the question of human rights around the time of the Iraq war. Um, because international law was instrumental uh, in the legitimation of that war, because international law, according to many quote unquote progressive lawyers was violated, nevertheless tolerated to say the least, the occupation of Iraq and clearly was not useful at all to hold the United States, the United Kingdom and the coalition of the willing forces accountable in any way whatsoever. It was extremely useless. Uh, according to one interpretation, it was violated against, uh, according to another interpretation, it was instrumental in my interpretation in facilitating that occupation, giving it a facade of legitimacy, if not also legality. Um, so I conclude my book by saying we have to think outside of international law we have to think outside of the human rights framework because the question remains whose interpretation of these violations stick in the world you know it's not mine um it's not social movements interpretation not necessarily but it's those in power who decide after all which laws uh are violated and which not, which laws are mobilized, which not. So international law and human rights are indeterminate um, to echo Marty Koske um, a great international legal scholar. That said, thinking more about what Gulai was just talking about, how social movements, including the social movement I was involved with, the World Tribunal on Iraq, have mobilized strategically these discourses of humanity, human rights, and international law raised for me uh, the question of strategy and tactics, of course, but also what Gulai just said in her reflection, the strategies you adopt end up adopting you. Um, so um, there comes a point where you almost forget to speak other languages of political imagination. Uh, you forget dreaming of other political worlds beyond the liberal uh, outlook enshrined in universal human rights. So those, on the one hand, those. On the other hand, there is a long history of trying to reinvent human rights, trying to signify more radical politics in the language of human rights, to make almost the liberal language of human rights unrecognizable. So that needs to be uh, cherished as well. They're not enough, uh, but not only are they not enough, they also change you the more you use them. Connecting to criminality, whenever I think we use the discourse of international law, argue for the criminality of George W. Bush, the criminality of Trump, the criminality of Putin, the criminality of X, Y, and Z. From an abolitionist perspective, we are producing, reproducing logics of legality and illegality at the global level. So I am always taken by, for example, abolitionist activists or anarchists who see no problem in adopting the language of criminality at the global level. I think we need a radical critique of legality and illegality at the international level. And in response to perhaps one of the questions to come, I can say in my thinking, one way to do that is to insist not only in the context of nation states, but also internationally, that a fundamental gap exists between what's just and what's legal. What, so justice and legality are not the same thing. So when we're objecting to something for being unjust, let us not resort to saying it's therefore illegal. 
It may or may not be illegal according to the law, what you think is unjust. So we have to redeem discourses of justice, reclaim, I think, discourses of justice, be them political, theological, um, cosmological, political, from law. We have to decolonize law to reclaim our own ideas of justice. That is crucial. Otherwise, we will keep accusing people of terrorism, or oh, this is state terrorism, or oh, this is uh, justified calling of someone as a terrorist. We have to get rid of this language of terrorism and criminality, I think, in our imagination of not only anti-colonial justice, uh, other forms of justice, but also global justice. Thank you for that, Aisha. Um, Leslie, Ogulai, you have a response or a follow-up. Go ahead. If I may, uh, I just want to reflect a little bit upon uh, the, the, the role of nation states. Uh, even in thinking about the solidarities uh, among different uh, movements, especially those anti-colonial movements, uh, there is this idea of nation state always there. It's not only about legality and illegality, but definitely linked to that because the law itself is a very much based on the nation state's idea. Uh, so uh, like, um, I think it's really uh, kind of important to go beyond the nationalistic uh, approach uh, and also the nation state based idea of solidarity as well in thinking about the solidarity. I just wanted to add that to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie, do you have? Agreed. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, what it's example? Of, but we can do it. We have to do it. If I may jump in, one example of what Gulai is talking about was the a uh, overnight proliferation, for example, of flags of Ukraine um, once the Russian attack on Ukraine began. Clearly people wanted to express solidarity, but why the temptation to turn to, the turn to the waving of a nation state flag when you're wanting to be in solidarity uh, with a group? Um, that is under attack. So it's just one little reflex we have. I mean, I imagined, for example, Turkey, I'm a citizen of Turkey, uh, being attacked, and I would be horrified if I saw Turkish flags waved everywhere uh, to stand in solidarity with peoples of Turkey uh living in turkey i would be just terrified i hope i don't get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> but yes we got to be more inventive than mobilizing the flags of nation states when I expressing solidarity i think yeah yeah um and 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 i don't know whether leslie you wanted to respond some more or rana has something to say to that before we move on yeah, you think I want to say something. I'm not quite sure what I want to say. It's your expression. I'm, I'm just like, are you trying to say something? I'm just making sure. I'm just <laughs> Uh, yes, I want to build on what Aisha was talking about these imaginaries. Like I found in my analysis of the fieldwork that I have done is that sometimes you have tensions between political imaginaries. So uh, again, as a case study, for example, the, uh, the BDS movement in Toronto, I have seen uh, sometimes, so BDS is a big umbrella where you have different uh, people with different political projects, you know, uh, that are, you know, that organize or that are activists with the BDS movement. And I've seen so, th those that uh, want to emphasize on the nation state or want to emphasize on uh, working within the framework of the Canadian state. So we do not challenge at all anything related to Canada. So, and this creates problems with uh, solidarity with the indigenous people, for example. Or you have others that want to emphasize on the language of the human rights and international law and 
in order to be more pragmatic. Because this is the language, according to these organizers or these activists, is that this is the language that most Western uh, audience understand. They do not understand what they perceive as quote unquote radical third world internationalism. And you have a third, like other political imaginary where like, no, we really need to revive these old traditions where let's call the, 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 these systems of oppressions exactly the way they are. It is settler colonialism. It's not apartheid. It's not a question of only human rights as it is perceived by the international law. The second thing I want to comment on what uh, um, uh, on what uh, Gulai was talking about criminalization, and as quote unquote terrorist, like who who portrays them as terrorist? It's this definition of the state that it's it's used. It's usually the definition of terrorism according to the state, and and the problem that some social movement, uh, you know. Um, sometimes adopt this uh, definition or they are a bit afraid and they do not challenge this definition so it definitely creates barriers it creates some um, fear factor i do not want to be perceived as terrorist or you know uh, defending someone who's terrorist yet it's very important to challenge what do we mean by terrorism Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I have a question for Aisha, actually. Uh, are you aware of like, uh, you know, some activists or movement that are working to challenge the international law as it is at the moment? Yes, there is the, th in the field of scholarship, there are the third world approaches, the international law movements, uh, which have been at the forefront of uh, demonstrating the colonial foundations of international law. I've been profoundly influenced by that school of thought. I have my critiques too, but uh, they've been revolutionizing the field of international law. It's interesting just how um, it's, it's very, once you start to break through these ideas, it can be um you're like oh yeah i wonder sometimes that when we move from away from the state i mean i'm very you know critical of the state but uh to the next to to something else whether we just take the same container and make it bigger um or whether we we actually kind of get to the fundamentals a, a, a deeper transition i'm thinking there's a, a friend of mine's involved in a project called maidan which is about mediterranean citizenship which is an interesting idea of that the entire region could be um, part of a, a political alliance. And I, I like, there's something very compelling to me about it, but then I'm thinking, is it just a bigger state? <laughs> I mean, it's definitely challenging, this idea. Well, that question has been raised in relation to the European Union, of course. Sure. Um, is that the nation state at a sup supra scale? Um, does it take away from our problems or expound them, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I, I also just wanted to tag on um, while I'm still scanning the room, um, you know, that you, you've talked about, you know, this importance of um, pursuing global justice outside of the law, I, I, the law, Aisha, in, you know, self-organized experimental ways so as to reconfigure the subject of planetary politics in terms either than the individual or the nation state or even humanity. And my question is, which is your question that you've asked to all of you is how, how do we do that? Or how do social movements do that? I'm, I'm guessing, you know, the question comes back to, is this even possible? Um, of course, you, you've, quite, you've cautioned that we have to continue to dream, which is really important because you know, you've said it, especially in, in these moments of crisis, we, we are thinking so much about the practical, the now, you know, alleviating things that we forget that we could actually create another world out there. So what are some of those ways? How do we build this, um, you know, these kinds of uh, global justice movements? I wasn't hoping that question would come back to me, uh, but I, I, 
Yes. Um, well, I thought about it. Uh, I've been thinking about this for a bit. Uh, let me state it negatively. Um, the temptation is there, especially given the climate catastrophe, the climate crisis, to politic, to organize, to build global movement in the name of humanity, for example. Uh, in one sense, to me, humanity is both too large and too small a subject to address what is coming our way, what is right here, the climate catastrophe. It, it's too small in the sense that it doesn't include, it's anthropocentric and it doesn't include non-human animals or non-human beings who are uh, also affected through um, climate catastrophe, basically. On the other hand, I think using these causes of humanity, humanity has caused, this has been pointed out by scholars, of course, perhaps instead of talking about the Anthropocene, we must be talking about a, a capitalocene or that, that would allow us to assign some responsibility. Because if we say humanity is causing these disasters, we avoid the question of, well, which humanity? Which part of humanity is largely responsible? So I want to, uh, you know, take us back to the Occupy movement, the brilliance of the, the slogan, where the 99%. What I'm trying to suggest is a blank discourse of humanity does not allow us to address questions of differential responsibility uh, in causing climate catastrophe or many other, the threat of nuclear war, for example. Uh, is the same. So my own thinking is evolving, but tonight, I think, uh, we have to introduce uh, enmity lines and responsibility lines. They may or may not fall along the global color line, along global class lines, uh, politics of gender and sexuality, whatever lines. It's just that one humanity is not responsible to the same degree for the state of the world that we're in. And I think we need to emphasize that. Um, so Gulai and others have already, Leslie too, spoke about the limitations of the nation state already. Um, and clearly the subject of planetary politics, at least clearly to me, cannot be the individual. Um, we, we cannot mobilize as individuals, for example, as the human rights framework assumes or an abstract cosmopolitanism assumes that we're a global civil society consisting of atomic individuals who may, who may come or may not come together in acts of solidarity on particular projects. I think we need a in, trans imagination um, trans border, transgenerational, um, trans geographic. I'm not sure about the necessary scale of organizing, as Leslie was saying, perhaps it's reproducing our problems at greater scale. But the unit of solidarity, uh, we have to reimagine itself. Humanity is too large and too small at the same time. Well, thank you. Um, too large and too small. I think I'm going to be thinking about, you know, mm. where this fit, especially as, as we talk to others. Um, Leslie, I see you're muted, but then I'll go to Rana as well. Yeah, I mean, I think if we could figure out how to truly do relational um, thinking <laughs> around around this, I think that would be critical I don't know I don't know how to do it and I mean it's it, the thing that's scary it, I mean I'm just like confessing right but uh it's scary to uh to move to say that that's not enough <laughs> when you know people are dying uh and we want to use all the tools we have 
um, yeah, I just like, what is it, what would it look like to actually try it and pay attention to this? I guess we just have to also accept that it's always partial, right? There's nothing gonna be pure here. <clears throat> we need to uh, uh, be critically engaged. I don't know, this is all sounding like cliches, but yeah, this is all we got. <laughs> Not just cliches, cliches, partial, relational emphasis, recognition. Yeah. Rana? So maybe I can add to what Leslie uh, was mentioning is also a work locally and uh, recognize that maybe my ability right now, I am at the moment in Beirut, I can work something in Beirut and I cannot work something in Istanbul at the moment. I can do it virtually, but my effect here being present in a specific place is very important. And when I'm working locally, I'm, lo I'm, also, work I'm also thinking um, that connection of whatever local struggles I'm, I'm fighting for, uh, the connection between these local struggles and the global struggles, because at the end, the systems of oppression are totally related to each other. Like we can trace them, but it's very important to talk about this relation between the different local struggles, regardless what are they, it can be racism, can be economic crisis, can be pandemic, can be wars, et cetera. At the end, you know, they go back to the same roots and keep talking. And it's very important to recognize that, you know, it's a long process. It's, it's not something that will happen tomorrow and not in hundred years. It's, uh, it's an ongoing process. May I give an example? I was reading the other day, Angela Davis, uh, one of her pieces, actually a speech she gave in Istanbul on the, at the invitation of Bozic University um, in memoriam of Hurant Ding. Uh, this, uh, anyways, she was talking about how, for example, during the protests in Ferguson, the tear gas used by the police was the, produced by the same company that was used in Palestine, uh, used against protesters. So it was a material linkage between the two movements that enabled when Palestinian activists were tweeting, you know, how do you resist this tear gas? This is what you do. We're so used to it. Do this, do that. So Rana is right. There are material connections uh, to structures of oppression. The structures of global capitalism give us the linkages actually that we need to build the kind of actions, direct actions, um, and indirect actions too, that uh, can ground our connections globally, that can teach us. I'm sorry, uh, I don't know if I should be apologetic about this, but solidarity is also a pedagogical project. It's mm -hmm. also learning from each other and with each other. Um, and the structures of oppression and exploitation offer us those material uh, connections. Yeah, hundred percent. I've just been doing this uh, People's Global Action Oral History Project, collecting these stories from activists that really push forward on the idea of doing kind of uh, global days of action that could be a local interpretation of a particular struggle or, or campaign um, and making it relevant and then building the capacity through the connections. Um, and let me think, think that changed the way we do politics um, in terms of the global connections that we could use those weak ties to share information. We don't have to like conflate it all into one big thing. Um, and we work now, though it still means it's difficult to make decisions as a, as a giant movement. <laughs> So the action part you can do, but this is the next step that sometimes gets a little more complicated. Yeah. And that kind of flows into another question that I had, but I want to make sure that people in the room, the audience, if you have any questions, um, please ask, raise your hand, put it in the chat. 
I will suspend my question um, if I should see your hand up. So I'll, I'm, I'm watching as I ask this. Um, you are all scholar activists and many of you are, well, not many, but perhaps all the other people in the room included in the many here, you've been on the front lines. And I'm just curious about whether you can share some of your, you know, ex uh, inspirations, even exasperations of being scholar activists. But more importantly for me is, you know, what has surprised you most um, on your research on the front lines? Has, it, has there been anything that has surprised you? Uh, maybe not most, because who knows if you can remember things that far, but. I didn't think of my work with the World Tribunal um, on Iraq activists as a front line, really. I'm thinking uh, not even as a field or field work. I was, I, you know, I thought of myself as an active participant in what I was trying to create with other people while observing at the same time. It was very difficult, extremely difficult to negotiate the two roles, uh, I must say. Uh, I didn't think it always helped me, helped me as an activist to be an academic. Um, in some cases, being an academic makes you a worse activist. Uh, but in most cases, I think being an activist helps you be a better academic. Um, it can, it can, it can give you that uh, intimate understanding. Like when Leslie was saying, it's another thing, decision making at the global level. I know she knows what she's talking about because she's been there, she's tried to. Uh, make those decisions, observe those decisions. So I just wanted to emphasize this, that being an academic is not necessarily a good thing for being an activist. Maybe others can respond to that if they feel inclined to do so. Yeah, I think it's, it's tricky, right? Uh, there's different logics in the two different ways of being. And I mean, I feel like I wouldn't want it any other way, but um, on the one hand, uh, you're not going to commit your, all of your, I mean, you can be a good academic, but you are trying to understand whether your work is valuable often um, to movements, not the only reason you do work, but uh, that can, your, your need to be accountable is going to, <laughs> is going to change the work that you do. Uh, and, you know, you're also not, you know, you're going to say things to the movements. If you're accountable, hopefully you can say them in a dialogue that maybe the movements may not want to hear. Um, and, you know, as an activist, uh, yeah, you're kind of a nerd and uh, asking awkward questions, right? So it's like, it's a, uh, <laughs> but it's those bridges. I mean, that's what this whole event is about, is working across difference in a productive way. And so it's what we have to do. Yeah? Practice and action, all those things. Yeah, Rana. I agree with Aicha that um, being an activist may, maybe makes you a better academic and not the other way around. Uh, one thing I found it a bit difficult is when doing the analysis, like, you know, analysis of the data that you have. And sometimes like you see something and you feel I should not talk about it. Like your, your decision of what you can, you make something that's visible or something that's invisible. You, your decision to this, to say that this may hurt the movement if I talk about it publicly or it does not uh, hurt the movement uh, these these are like very difficult decisions actually as an engage with yet it's very important to have these discussions like leslie said that you know uh, sometimes you know you want to 
say something the movement you're engaged with with that people do not want to to listen to but how can we advance you know it's very important to have this dialogue sometimes i may see something or you know found it very shocking i did not know about it so unless we know about it unless we discuss and we take it back to the movement that hold on there are certain problems here or there are certain or there are certain opportunities and so on we cannot advance uh, as as social movement i think there is a need to bridge this uh, you know academic versus activist is it a very straightforward like very easy to be done of course not it's very difficult yeah and i i hear you oh, yeah go ahead aisha um i think both good activists and good academics feel this responsibility um of pointing out opportunities as well as weaknesses and mistakes. So maybe the distinction between the demands of the two are not as sharp as we think they are, because movements also owe it to themselves to engage in criticism. I'm talking about self-criticism. Um, and if we think intergenerationally, um, leaving those, I don't want to say lessons, it sounds too uh, presumptuous to say, who am I to draw lessons from this, but observations for later reflection by another generation. Already there are, there's another generation since the occupation of Iraq, who is looking now to think, okay, what was that global movement? The global justice movement at the turn of the 2000s. I have students who are researching, like what were their contradictions? What did they discuss? And I'm pointing out to the books of my friends and the pamphlets of friends, etc. So that work is necessary. It, to some extent, movement ethnographers are self-appointed um chroniclers and there's great responsibility that comes with that i agree with rana that decisions have to be made about what is going to be publicized and what's not going to be publicized who needs to hear what when um etc and we need to take full responsibility for that both as activists and as uh, academics Thank you very much um, for that. Leslie, you're muted. Oh, yeah, well, it's just, just a thought because I think there's been such interesting work about the case in which we haven't talked about of, of uh, solidarity around um, apartheid South Africa. And um, and some, some, well, I mean, I know you, you know this work, right? But just was thinking about like, what is this? <laughs> what is the strategy? How do you um, do the research and support the movement? Um, when the stakes are very high. Mm. Yeah. And on that note, um, I would be bringing the discussions to a close. Thank you so much um, again for spending this time at this you know, particular time of the term or semester, depending on where you are um, with us and you know, um, just agreeing to have this conversation, very difficult conversations and you've even left us with more difficult questions um, you know, and, and, and how do we, you know, and how to move forward in, in some ways, how do we connect the dots as Nestle was saying, do the difficult work of um, the quotidian everyday work, um, as Aisha was saying, building those bridges and networks in between crisis or even during crisis, uh, moments um, at, at every one particular point in time. And as Rana has asked, you know, how do we do all of this in the midst of all the multiple crises that we have to, to, to work through and doing the work locally to ensure that globally we can all really be in solidarity. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. And to go back to the question of we the 99% in the world, right? You know, the, the world does belong to us. <laughs> But then moving um, beyond human, the human centeredness of our work and our wells to actually embracing the planet and planetary politics and what that would be like. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for the thought provoking conversations. Um, it's been a pleasure being the moderator. Thank Let's you see. for bringing us together. This was fantastic and memorable. Thank you for the stimulating conversation. Thank you.
My mm -hmm. only um, regret is that we cannot gather after this to drink some wine or eat some food <laughs> and together and actually see each other um, in person. But also, you know, thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you so much, Sue, for all the work that you do behind the scenes to make this a reality. And for those of you who are listening and were kind enough to join us, watch out and look out for more um, um, information from the Resource Center for Public Sociology. We will be hosting this on our website, so I'm sure we'll see more engagement from them as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sylvia. Bye -bye. Bye. That was wonderful. Thank you so much.